as I get older, there are a handful of verses that become more and more meaningful to me. And as I think about uh, key moments in my life, there are a handful of stories that have more meaning for me. One of the key verses for me is from Acts 17. It's whenever Paul was speaking at the Areopagus in Athens, and he's talking about this sovereign God who is involved in the intimate details of life. He says about humanity that he has determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. And I take that text to really mean that we're not here by accident. You're not a student at Lipscomb by accident. I don't work here by accident. Certainly our president's not here by accident. God is involved in this. He's alive and well and active in this world. And he, he knows where you are and what you're about. And he's orchestrating human events in really a play to get us to think the bigger thoughts and ask the deeper questions. Paul said it this way, he did this so that men would seek after him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So God's working. And I know that God's been working in the last decade in, in Dr. Lowry being here and, and turning this institution around, 85% enrollment growth, a lot of really neat numbers, a lot of buildings that have gone up. But I go back to a, a story when we were riding in the car from Chattanooga back to Nashville. We'd gone down there, I think, for a funeral and we're riding back. And Dr. Lowry shared his heart with me about you students and about how important he felt it was to keep the mission of a Christ-centered institution really at the center of this place. And Mark, he talked about missions and he talked about how exciting it was to hear some of the stories about missions and the hundreds of students that go out over spring break and all the great things that happen around the world. And many of you have been touched by that and your life has been completely turned upside down by that. And he said, you know, I wouldn't change a bit of that and won't change a bit of that. But he said, I really have a burden for the ones that, that God brings us. He keeps bringing us about 2,500 to 3,000 students and puts them right in our lap. And, and he said in the car, what are we doing with those students? Are we making sure that each student that comes our way has to wrestle with the identity of Jesus Christ? He said, I feel a keen burden and a sense of responsibility and feel like one day I'll stand before God and have to give an account. And so I want to make sure, this is Dr. Lowry's words, I want to make sure that we're making sure Students wrestle with the biggest question of life. Who is Jesus and what are you going to do with him? And so we started then about five years ago, this conversation about resurrection week and really putting a focus and having at least one time through the year where we really in a concerted way say, we're going to put first things first because we believe that we don't buy into a story about a man who died a long time ago, we buy into a story about a risen Savior. And so Dr. Lowry is going to be the one that's going to share with us now about that resurrected Christ, and, and I'm going to ask him to come up here. I'm going to pray over him and uh, let him share with you his heart for you and for this place and our resurrected Savior. Father, I'm thankful for Randy, and I pray for your Holy Spirit be strong on him today and to speak through him and to use him. Father, just please, uh, your will be done in this moment. And Father, please uh, help Randy to say just the things that you would have him to say and share his heart for these students and for this place. May your kingdom more fully come here in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you and welcome back. It is such a joy to know we had spring break and as far as we know, uh, everybody's back, everybody was safe. God has blessed you uh, as a student body and blessed this institution with his care and his presence during a time that you were in at least 11 or 12 or 13 different countries. You spread out around the world. We hope you had a good time, hope you served well, but we're blessed that you're back as we look now at the next five or six weeks and the end of this academic year. Uh, I'll be back to talk to you in a couple of weeks, and when I do, I want to tell you about some exciting things at the university. 
Uh, I want to tell you about the new 125 parking spaces that are already being developed on the northeast part of the campus. You can see near the engineering building, they're already starting, and uh, there's a lot more to do there, but we eventually will bring, uh, in the next 36 months, all of the Stokes parking back onto this campus so it will be convenient and safe for you. Uh, I'll be back to talk about the new Performing Arts Center and the plans that are developing there. I was with Pat and Shirley Boone in California this last week, and they're excited about it, and it's going to be a signature facility and support a lot of different areas of this university. Uh, I'll be back to talk about Johnson Hall that will be redone this summer, just like, just like High Rise was redone last summer. Uh, it will be transformed in a much, much nicer place. Uh, and there are a lot of other things going on. We'll talk about those later. Uh, but this is a very special moment. It's a very special week. It's a moment where we pause and say, not what's going on around us, but, but what has happened in this much, much larger story. And so we take the events around us and we, we celebrate them. We celebrate those who uh, went out last week and uh, did mission work uh, literally all over the world. We celebrate all of you that two weeks ago welcomed President George Bush. And you impressed him and impressed so many people with who you are and how you handle those kinds of moments. But they pale in significance. They pale in significance to the part of the story we reach out and share this week. This is an amazing part of the story. You've all been introduced to the story of Jesus in that first course in your freshman year. But here's the moment that is most significant. We understand that he was born and we celebrated that at Christmas and the world paused for a moment. And then we get to this moment a few weeks later and we are seeing the end of that story. And it's amazing how it's easy to almost skip over it and in skipping over it to miss what is the most profound moment in the entire story. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he said, you know, if this isn't true, if this idea of resurrection is not right, uh, if this didn't happen, then we who have believed that are among all people to be most pitied. He placed everything on this moment as those who are Christians must do. I was going to speak on Easter several weeks ago, several years ago, and I, I'm driving to a church to speak, and on the way I see this sign. Uh, and the sign was kind of interesting to me. I thought it was humorous. Uh, I mean, here they are saying, uh, Jesus, he is risen. This is the most spectacular moment in the history of humankind, of God's creation. And then right underneath it, it says, and hamburger steak today, $5.99. And I thought that was symbolic. Symbolic of the world that can say, here's the moment, let's celebrate it, but let's get back to the mundane. Hamburger steak, today it's on special, $5.99, and you probably get two vegetables as well. And so we do take this week, and we do pause a moment to kind of say, let's think about this, because it is so very, very profound. You know the story. You know what led up to this moment. Jesus has been involved in ministry. Jesus has been healing people. Jesus has brought disciples close to him. He's been sharing this story and this message. Some people understood it and some people didn't. And now we go through the moments of the passion where he's arrested and where he's charged and where he's finally crucified. And then he's put into that borrowed tomb and they were so worried about the fulfillment of prophecy, what they had heard, that they put guards on that tomb that if they miss in carrying out their duty, would themselves be killed. They sealed that tomb. And then something amazing happened. And so we pick up the story in the 28th chapter of Matthew. And I want you to think about the moment and as these events occur. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of them that they shook. They shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. If you only remember three words from uh, what I might present to you in the next few moments, it's those three words, come and see. Because those words were an invitation to those two women who, who needed the evidence that Jesus was no longer there. But they are words that come across 2,000 years and they're an invitation to us as well. Come and see. I know that as we think about something like resurrection, it's hard to get our head around. It's hard to explain. And yet there's this invitation if you're part of this story, to come and see this moment, unexplainable as it is, but pivotal in all of faith. Let me share with you just three ideas that I think we wrestle with. One of them is the sense that the invitation to come and see has a real historical context. Uh, there was a moment where the guards were placed. There was a moment where the tomb was sealed. There was a moment where their lives were at stake to make sure nothing happened to this Jesus who was put in the borrowed tomb. And then there was this moment. And here are the two Marys who are coming, uh, and they're going to check out and probably take care of the body. And here the sun has come up, and it's okay for them to do that. And they arrive, and here are these events. And while the Gospels, well, they don't share the events exactly the same way, they do share the moment and the reality that Jesus was supposed to be there, and Jesus was gone. Now, for 2,000 years, we've argued about this. Some people say, well, you know, he never really died. Uh, here's how we can explain it. When they took him down from the cross, he was not dead, and somehow took off and was somewhere else. Others say, no, no, you know, it, it was a matter of, of, of another series of events. His body was stolen. He wasn't raised from the dead. That would be way outside of our understanding. Somehow somebody got in there and stole the body so people would think that prophecy was fulfilled. But do you ever think about the reality that those who were closest didn't have much question? In fact, those closest followers could have said, well, that Messiah really wasn't, and so we're going to follow someone else. They didn't. In fact, 11 of those followers also gave their lives because of their belief in this story. And so we try to figure out how to come to grips with it. And my sense is one of the reasons that we have so much difficulty in today's world is that we are into science and proof. And if we can't prove it or understand it ourselves, we just can't believe that it would be true. And we at the university probably encourage that because we encourage you to look scientifically and analytically and to go through the steps where you're convinced and yet here's a moment that all the science in the world is not going to prove it, but it may still be true. I thought about the announcement yesterday. You probably saw that. Apple once again has the next generation of an iPhone. They have the next generation of what so many of us use that keeps us connected and, and, and gives us life unimaginable five, ten years ago. And I look at this iPhone and uh, know that as of yesterday, mine's out of date. Uh, and yet I look at what it will do, and I don't understand it, but I believe in it. I don't understand how it does what it does, but over and over again, it proves it to me. I had to go to Rochester, Minnesota last, or Michigan last week, and here I was at the Detroit airport, and I punched in an address, and it was about 30 miles away, and here my iPhone takes me street by street, freeway by freeway, block by block, to the driveway of the home I needed to, how does it do that? 
Or a number of years ago, we were in Spain and Rhonda wanted some Starbucks. And I didn't know where a Starbucks was, but I remember I have the app. And I press the app and all of a sudden it tells me not only where the closest Starbucks in Spain might be, but tells me how to walk there and how many minutes it will take. Really? I can't explain it. Or the music stuff, I can't explain that. I mean, here I am in my car and I put this up to the radio. See, this com seems completely normal to all of you, but if you're a little older, it's kind of different. I, I put this up to the radio and it tells me the song that's playing. Uh, it tells me about uh, where I can buy it for 99 cents and I can push a button or two and all of a sudden I have it. How does that happen? Are there little guys in here that when I do something, they just run around really quickly and get it done? How does that work? And while I don't understand it and I can't explain it, it is very, very real. And so let's not dismiss the resurrection just because we can't explain it. There's a lot about God that we can't explain, a lot about this world that we can't explain, a lot about love and relationships, and a lot about life that we can't really explain, but it doesn't mean those things aren't very, very real. But that's all historical. That's all looking back with the invitation to come and see and going back 2,000 years what if that invitation dealt with today? What if it was not just a historical moment, but that invitation was one that said, come and see because resurrection is taking place around you today. All you have to do is go outside and realize as you see the Bradford pears or the other trees coming to life that, that they were dead for three or four months as we went through the ice and the snow in winter and all of a sudden, resurrection is coming. New life is brought. And I want you to think about your individual lives for a moment because I would guess every one of us, every one of you could point to some moments where you said, there's a moment where I died. There's a moment of death. There's a moment of supreme disappointment or sorrow. And yet from that moment, life came. I've shared with you perhaps before about my uh, astoundingly unsuccessful Little League career. Uh, it was my first year in Little League and I was in what we call the majors. I'd never played baseball before. And all of a sudden I'm in with these folks that have been playing for several years and I was just not very good. Uh, and I played the whole season. I had a wonderful coach. It was really a pretty good time until the very, very last of the season, after the very last game, they handed out a piece of paper and it had every kid on the team listed by their batting average. And so it was in order from the top to the bottom and every one of us grabbed that and looked for our name and in my case, I went all the way to the bottom. In fact, I was such an unathlete uh, that when I looked at that batting average, it was point zero, zero, zero. Okay, my entire Little League career, I never had a hit. But now, I, I did learn how to get on base because I learned the pitchers were bad enough that if you leaned over far enough, they would hit you. Uh, they would hit you. And so they would hit me on the left shoulder and I would get to, so I ran on bases a lot. I scored a lot of runs, but my batting average was point zero, zero, zero. And as a 12 year old boy, that was a moment of death. That was a moment where nothing seemed right, like the story wasn't ending like it should, like I was embarrassed and I could do absolutely nothing about it at 12 years old. That's a little death. But then God has a sense of humor. God has a sense of humor because 
life comes and sometimes in unexpected ways. And I sat one day a couple of years ago as the president of the Atlantic Sun Division I Conference. And I'm sitting at the end of the table and at the table are all the other college presidents and we're running this Division I Conference. And I sat there and thought to myself, but didn't say to any of them, point zero, zero, zero. God has a sense of humor. I never will forget the day driving down Snelling Avenue in St. Paul, Minnesota. My wife is in the car. She's just been to the doctor. We thought we were going to have our first child. And she tells me about the doctor visit and she tells me that the doctor tried as nice as he could to say that our child to be, her pregnancy, that there was no viability, no life there. And so as we drove north on Snelling Avenue, both crying and trying to come to grips with the fact that we've lost our first child, there was a moment of death. And yet just a few months ago, we went to Hawaii to celebrate the marriage of our foster son, a child that came after our three children uh, and God gave us one more. And in about three weeks, he is now married and they will have their first child. There are moments of death, but we're reminded all the time that God brings life, that resurrection from those moments is real. I was pleased to see out of the mission work that went on last week, the picture from, uh, I think, El Salvador uh, with our women's soccer team. And, and here are some young women who have said, I'm going to live a life of resurrection. I'm going to be a part of what God's doing. And not only inside of me, but I'm going to be part of it as, as I live my life. A moment of estrangement and then a moment of community. A moment of relationship. A moment, perhaps, of resurrection. Finally, it seems to me that as we think about the invitation to come and see. It's not just historical and it's not just today. We anticipate it as we look at the future. God is going to continue to bring life. When President Bush was here just a few days ago, Senator Frist was here as well. You may know Senator Frist was in the U.S. Senate. He was the majority leader of the Senate, had a distinguished political career, but before that, was a heart transplant surgeon and continues to practice medicine at some level. And he told me one time about what it was like to transplant a human heart. I can't quite imagine it, but he said it goes something like this. I'm in my bed at home and I get a telephone call. It might be two o'clock in the morning and they'll be calling from Vanderbilt and they'll say, Dr. Frist, uh, we have a heart and we have a recipient. You need to get up. And so he would get up. He would get dressed. There would be a car waiting for him out front. It would take him to the national airport. He would get there, hop in a plane. That plane would take him to some city within an hour or so of Nashville He'd be met by an ambulance, taken to a hospital there, <clears throat> and he would walk into a room, and there was the person who was clinically dead, but whose heart was still alive. And so they would harvest that heart. Now think about it. He walks into the room, and here's all of this medical energy, and here's the person laying on the gurney whose heart is going to be given up for someone else. And he said we would take that heart and we put it into an igloo ice bucket. You know, those are kind of funny little ice buckets that uh, the construction people take their lunch in. And they would take this human heart and they would put it in the ice bucket, surround it by ice, and then go back through all the same steps again. Back to the ambulance, back to the airplane, arrive back in Nashville, <coughs> get in the ambulance at the airport, come to Vanderbilt, and he would walk in another room very much like the first one. Here would be doctors and nurses and lots of energy and all this medical expertise. And there, though, on the gurney in that room was someone who was going to receive a human heart. 
And he describes this because he's an outstanding physician and he can tell us about all the science that goes into it and all the medical knowledge. And they go through several hours of work. They have about four hours start to finish to get that heart into someone. And once it's all hooked up, he says there's an amazing moment. There's an amazing moment because everyone kind of stands back and somebody over here on a machine moves some dials and, and, and human blood starts flowing into that heart again. And they all stand back waiting for it to happen. He said there's a silence in the room as they're watching the monitor and they're watching this heart and pretty soon it begins to wiggle just a little bit. And pretty soon they see more movement. And pretty soon it recognizes the life-giving blood and it starts to beat over and over and over again. And he told me, he said, Randy, you know, I can explain everything up until that moment. But I cannot explain how that human heart recognizes that life-giving blood and starts doing once again what it was created to do. It's been in an ice chest for the last four hours. But it recognizes God giving it life. And so as you go through this week, there's a historical moment. And you can wrestle with that in your mind about how this happened 2,000 years ago. There's a very present moment. How are you doing in terms of the little deaths in your life and your longing for God's life to come in once again. And then there's a sense of anticipation. The idea of coming to see what hasn't happened yet and trusting in this larger story that God has given us that resurrection will take place here once again. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful week. Thank you for being a part of this community you are the reason we get up in the morning and try to work hard so that your lives can be changed and you can leave this university as our product, leave this university as God's children to literally change the world. We love you. We appreciate you.